Legion, Season 1, Episode 4, Thoughts. This episode is called Chapter 4, another episode I love. Spoilers for everything X-Men leading up to and including this episode. Let's dive right in. So, I really appreciate how each episode opening so far has basically had me thinking, did I accidentally skip an episode? I, I kind of hope that keeps up. I, I seriously respect, you know, yeah, all four episodes so far have opened like maybe the audience missed something. You know, it's a good day when Jermaine Clement shows up on your screen. Um, at first, we're wondering, who is this guy? And then later, it's like, oh, that's Oliver. Okay. I, I have to admit, I did not realize, I, I mean, I guess that was his voice we were hearing as the, the you know, elevator voice and the, the robot or, you know, the, yeah, coffee making robot or whatever. You know, I guess I'm just not familiar enough with his voice. I'm not going to pretend like he doesn't have a very distinct voice. I just haven't seen him in that many things, but I'm always a big fan of when he shows up. So once we realize, oh, that's, that's Oliver... Then I thought, oh, the opening of this episode, that's something he says to David later, and nope. Because we see, you know, it, it seems like we see everything that he says to David, more or less, at the very least. And that really does leave pretty much just the... Okay, I guess there's two options. Maybe he's just talking to himself. Maybe he's just... You know, like, yeah, talking even though there's no one, you know, in the room with him. Which, I don't know, I cannot relate to that at all. It seems pretty ridiculous kind of thing to do. Or, and this is partially backed up by the fact that he does make, you know, he's breaking the fourth wall. He's making eye contact with the camera, with the viewer. Maybe he is actually talking to the viewer of the show Legion, which would be very meta, and I'm here for it. And let's see. Uh, yeah, yeah, but you know the the so so yeah, he gives this opening monologue soliloquy, and you know he he gets his his glass, and you know he he tilts it slightly. Something, you know, slides out. Yes, it's ice. No, I will never tire of that quote. I, I just love the passion with which he says it. You know, it's like, okay, I get you're frustrated, but wow. And let's see. But yeah, you know, he, he talks about, you know, there are two kinds of stories we tell our children. Those that teach empathy, those that teach fear... And then those impulses compete. And tonight's story is going to be about both. Let's see. Sometimes I just there's there's certain lines that I just kinda kinda like, even if you know, just I I like um Tonami Wallace saying wherever his mind is, I can't find it. You know, they, they don't just stop at, you know, oh, if, you know, his mind should be in his body, but it isn't. No, he, he goes on to say, you know, I... Because once you can read minds, yeah, that seems like a completely natural, yeah. And, yeah, they bring up the astral plane, so... Yeah, I mean, I, I guess that really was astral projecting in the... Yeah. And, and, yeah, this is not the only story where someone, you know, being able to connect to the astral plane, you know, at first they struggle with controlling that power. So, yeah, that makes, a, it's, it's consistent with other fiction on that. And, yeah, um, carry with a K, as usual. Hitting some? Why are you always hitting something? And you know they're they're talking about the the mission as uh, you know pros and cons, and and Carrie's like, 
if I get to kick people, I'm in. <laughs> I really, really like her character. Let's see. And... Yeah, quite appreciate Tonami pointing out, you know, memory is unreliable. And... Yeah, um, his point, you know, objects have memory too. Is also quite good. Yeah, and the, the you know, how are how are we certain that this isn't still a dream? Oh, I'm I'm certain. I mean, I'm pretty sure. Which also, like, if you spend that much time, you know, inside people's memories, yeah, at some point you might be like, um. I am like 18% sure that this is reality. And let's see. Um, yeah, again, the, the question is brought up. What was the answer? What did the stars say? And I appreciate, by the end of this episode, we still don't know the answer to this one. May, maybe we'll know by the end of the season. And, yeah, we learn, I, I wish I'd said it because I did think that that might have happened, but yeah, from, you know, based on episode three, I was wondering, you know, is this going to be, because every so often you hear a story like that, is this going to be one of the ones where, you know, when the person, the, the, when the, when the patient was robbing his, you know, shrink was, you know, yeah, did the shrink return and catch them in the act? And did that maybe end in violence? You know, yeah, this episode confirms that did indeed happen. And, yeah, we're told, you know, he, he went into a coma because it's just, yeah, really, really intense. And, yeah, um, great line when Phil, Philly, you know, says, you know, David had no evidence that he was ever a child or so, something along those lines, you know. And then we have this thing of, you know, the, the, yeah, it's like a, a frame skip, a, a hidden hidden frame, something like that, you know. And and yeah, that turns out to be the the location that Doctor Poole moved to, although he's been replaced by the time they get there in the in the present in reality. But yeah, you know, when when Philly said, you know, the words evidence that he was ever a child immediately David, you know, he doesn't say it out loud, but he thinks to, you know, well, Dr. Bull is still out there, you know, I destroyed the, the, the cassette tapes, I don't remember cassette tapes, but, you know, he is still out there, and, and the, that great line, the, oh, right, and, yeah, and obviously Dr. Pool is actually sitting there, right then as well I do realize that also yeah he thought about you know if I guess maybe it's he's thinking I hope Philly never sees Dr. Poole without me being there because Dr. Poole might tell her maybe it's something along those lines anyway and yeah the thing about you know we are the stories we tell ourselves or the, yeah, something along those lines, not verbatim. And, yeah, Amy is fed, and it's clear that it's been a very long time. You know, she's extremely hungry, so much expressed without words. Like, she does eventually start talking to Dr. Kissinger in the next cell. I am resisting the urge to say... Something about maybe how is is not the only Kissinger who should have gone to prison. Anyway, um, but but yeah, you know, before she starts talking to him, 
it's it's exclamations and she conveys so much i i love when a lot is conveyed without words i think that is severely underrated you know and and katie asselton who plays amy holler fantastic performance because there is that thing like at first there's a there's a sense of relief like finally finally you know because I, th I think we've all had an, at least one experience in our lives where we were extremely hungry, and when you finally get something, it's just it's such a relief, you know. But there's also this thing of you know she's still a prisoner. She's you know the reason she hasn't gotten anything to eat for a long time is not through any fault of her own. It's because they took her. And, you know, the food is reminding her of that. So she ends up throwing the the tray away. And, you know, Dr. Kissinger, he's been there for so long with no human contact that he's actually started to, to lose his sense of self. He, You know, the first thing he says when he realizes that there's someone in the other cell is, I'm I'm real. I exist. You know, again, not saying that's verbatim, but something to that effect. And yeah, they talk about you know, did you know that he had superpowers? And you know, Amy is like, I I should have known. And and then we get the the. Apparently, they never had a dog. Okay, um, apparently Angry Boy is played by a stunt woman named Devin Dalton. Sorry, just her, her picture literally jumped out at me. Well, yeah, as she does a really great job. There's a significant pre physical presence to that, you know, the, the face is this, this big masked head thing, you know, but the physical presence is, is quite intense. A lot of really talented stunt women in, in Hollywood. Really glad when they get to show how talented they are. And, yeah. Um, then the show spelled something out that we kind of saw, like, there was just enough evidence that, that we could piece this together ourselves. Carrie and Carrie share one body. And I like the detail that, and Sid, Sid picks up on this too, when Carrie with a K retells it, she retells it from the point of view of Carrie with a C. You know, Carrie with a C, one day, you know, oh, there's this eight-year-old girl there. Which they say that she grows when she's outside. When, yeah, when she has the body. So if she was eight when he was eight, that means that they've both, you know, back then they, they basically, it was 50-50, it was this timeshare body thing. And then, you know, later that changed, and that's why she is younger than than he is. You know, when, when they were... Oh, huh. Is that... Okay, uh, I was gonna say how old Amber Mithunder is, but the... Okay, here we go. Yeah, let's see. She was, she was born in... It was just that on IMDb, it didn't say. It only said the day. Not the year, but yeah, she's from 1997, so when this episode was filmed, she was 19 or 20 or so. And, yeah, the, the, if I, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and real quick look. So Bill Irwin, who plays Carrie with a C, he's from 1950, so there's a 47 year difference there that's yeah so so you know they made the decision that she wasn't gonna take over the body like as much 
this means that there are eight years, the first eight years of, of Carrie with a K's life and experiences, she doesn't share with Sid. And, you know, they're teammates. It's not like there's some, you know, I, I don't think Sid would, like, hold it against her. You know, she can be kind of snarky, but she's a, she is a good person. She tries to do the right thing. So Carrie with a K, you know, maybe she's, maybe there's something in those first eight years that she really doesn't want to remember. You know, maybe there's something that she doesn't want Carrie with a C to find out. You know, yeah, it's just, it's very interesting. I quite appreciate both that the show itself does this, but also that Sid points it out. I, I, I'm afraid I don't remember exactly what Carrie with a K said after the, after Sid pointed that out. But, yeah, that was a, a very interesting detail. And I love that for some of the this backstory exposition about, you know, how Carrie with a C realized about Carrie with a K, some of it, we have some overlap of the voiceover. They'll say the exact same line. That was a very nice... I, I really appreciate it. Like, they kind of did... They tried to think of the trippiest X-Men powers, X-Men universe powers that we hadn't already seen and put them all in this one show. It's it's kind of cuz when you think about it, like this thing of, you know, two people sharing one body, that doesn't really it's not quite the same as David's DID and you know, t uh, telepathy and such. It's, you know, they're, they're both very trippy, very, like, unusual, you know, in a, in a medium that is where, where, you know, when you think superpower, like, one of the first, you know, some of the first things that pop into people's heads, like super strength or flight or stuff like that, and, you know, yeah, here, it's shared bodies, it's DID. Okay, I suppose sharing a body in DID, there's a certain, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, you know what? I hadn't really thought about that. Yeah. Moving on. We're gonna we're gonna pretend I had it right from the start. If the you know, when when this comes up on the quiz, I'll I'd like the entire class to just pretend I was right from the start. And let's see, then we have the um yeah, yeah, we have the thing about, you know, yeah, Carrie with a K says, you know, he does the boring stuff, I get the action. He makes me laugh, I keep him safe. Maybe that's weird, I think it's okay. You know, I really appreciate how the show, like, it describes these very unusual situations, you know, which... Yeah, you know, a lot of people, I, you know, not sure anyone in the real world has had the exact same experience as any of the characters on the show so far, but everybody has an unusual situation. You know, normal is a setting of a dryer. I can't believe I just gave a positive quote to Suicide Squad 2016, but yeah, normal is not real. That's, it's... You know, some people aspire to it. I think normal is pretty boring. But, you know, yeah. It's unusual situations. Instead of trying to make them normal, instead of trying to put a, you know, square peg in a round hole, let's try to find a way to be comfortable with it. And, and yeah, you know, like, the carries have a very unusual situation but it sounds like they're at peace with it, and they're, you know, yeah. He makes me laugh. I keep him safe. Maybe that's weird, but that's okay with us. You know, that's, yeah. Like, there's a lot of people who have situations that, like, a lot of other people would say, oh, that's not okay. But, yeah, if the, you know, as long as there's consent, and it's, like, not abusive, and people are happy, yeah, really, really loving the 
yeah, how this show handles these things. And, yeah, then we, we see the, the, we see Oliver in the diving suit. And I like the detail that Melanie, even after all this time, Carrie with a C still has to remind her, please don't touch, you know, because, yeah, like, I, I don't know what, you know, the exact circumstance, but clearly it's extremely cold. You know, the, the, yeah, if she touched it with her bare hands, that's B-A-R-E, instead of putting on the, the rubber glove first, yeah, she probably, it would, it would hurt her. And, yeah, you know, the, she, she says maybe he's waking up and Carrie with a C is like, please don't get your hopes up. This is not, you know, it might never happen. And, then we get the detail, which is very such a such an interesting idea. Carrie with a K only ages when she has the body, and Carrie with a C wonders out loud what might happen to her when he dies. And yeah, um, Melanie is like, maybe Oliver is communicating with us. That's why the false alarm. You know, because that is like, if the if he can only make the robot say things, say certain things, yeah. What what was it? Something like uninvited company or something like that. You know, is he saying, "I can tell you're in here." Maybe, you know, maybe that's the closest that he could get to saying thank you for, for coming to see me again, you know, something like that. And 23 minutes in to an episode that's, I think, just under 50 minutes, so, you know, almost halfway, that's when we see David in a new situation and not just a memory you know, that is very gutsy, and I really applaud them for, because he's the lead, you know, this is, maybe a later become an ensemble show, but so far I would definitely say he's the lead, everything kind of comes back to him, like, when we're not seeing him, we're usually seeing people who are, like, talking about, well, what do we do for David, you know, or how do we catch David, depending on who it is, you know, but... Yeah, this is the first 23 minutes in. We finally see him. Finally. We, we see him again. And it's not, quote-unquote, just a memory. You know, we... The, the, it was the, Before it was stuff that was new to us, sure, the viewer, but it wasn't something that David was actively doing now. And, and yeah, now we get to that. And not gonna lie, the diving suit really gives me Alan Wake vibes, which... I mean, I'm not sure I would say either of them ripped the other off. Let's see. Oh, that's right. Yeah, Alan Wake is 2010. Why does that feel like a century ago? So, yeah, they did have the idea before before this show was in, you know, was being written and, and such. But at least the, the finalized scripts and such. But... I felt it was different enough. And then the the yeah Oliver puts on music and it's this like he might as well have put on thrash metal like holy crap. And and you know after a little while he's like oh right lungs you have this you have the thing where you kind of need quiet you know I like jazz and then the yeah um, Oliver explains the the space that he's in and I like the detail that the one thing he couldn't quite fix is how cold it is and I'm not 100% certain if he forgot social skills while he was under 
it's possible that he is on the spectrum and was always like this. Again, I really appreciate like the show doesn't really have us like laugh at him. He's not like a clown or something that we're just amuses us. He he's a he's a character, you know. Every there's a lot of quirky characters on the show. He's another quirky character. You know, not all of the quirky characters on the show have you know struggle with with like social interaction and such. You know, but yeah, he's he's another another aspect that just another element where they're exploring you know not normal but not as not miserable you know there's a lot of characters on the show that they're not miserable they're not normal they're not necessarily hoping to ever be normal you know like Sid one of the first thing yeah you know, one of the very first things we learn about her is she cannot physically touch anyone you know, at first they say she doesn't, that it's a psychological thing, not a superpower thing, but she says shortly after that she's happy. You know, she her happy place is the, the guy by himself, the, the cartoon on the on the des deserted island. You know, she, she went, the thing she said was, I would be happy if I was by myself. You know, that's a, she doesn't say... I'm miserable all the time, although one could infer that. No, she says, I'm happy when I'm by myself. That, you know, that implies agency. That implies when I am able to be by myself, I make sure I am, and then I'm happy. You know, she doesn't say, I'm lonely at that point. And, yeah. Oliver points out, you know, if you go back out there, the monsters out there, we see the devil with the yellow eyes there. And I quite appreciate that, you know. So David, you know, he hasn't figured out how to use his powers yet, but he knows he's going to. So, you know, he pulls several poses and one of them is indeed the the classic, you know, Xavier thing. So, yeah. Very nicely done. And, yeah, the line about, you know, you can imagine anything in here, but you cannot make it real. And some more great voiceover. And, I, yeah, I, I like, you know, very early in the scene, Carrie with a K is like, we're gonna, I, I, I get to fight soon, right? <laughs> And yeah, they're they're just going to talk to to Philly. Oh right, this is the part where we get the you know evidence that he had a past and and um yeah, Tonami rewinds to to see. Yeah, I don't know why I was thinking it was in that other scene. Anyway, um yeah, and and. You know, once Tonami has all the. Let's. Oh, hold on. Did I miss something? Oh, oh, right, right. Yeah, the the. When they're talking to to Philly to get information, yeah, they mention you know. Yeah, there's the line about you know oh we'd we'd like to have kids, and and Philly's like congratulations, you know, I, I knew you had that glow about you, and then there's the line about, no, 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 we, we want to have kids, we don't, we're not, not yet, for now, we're, we're talking about having kids, and Philly says, you don't get kids by just talking, sex has been brought up at least once in each of these four episodes now, and I can imagine that's a, a theme that's going to continue. As I've said in other videos, I'm not prudish, so it doesn't bother me. I can't help but notice it. And you know, obviously, you know, some some people would say, "Well, you know, it's TVMA; they get to, so of course they're gonna." I just I can't help but notice that they're like. 
you know, sometimes it's saying something about sex. Like when the 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 time in episode three where Sid walks into a memory of where where David is having sex, and you know at first she's like, oh, well, I I must have left my eyes, but she does look back and like check it out, you know, because she's obviously sexually frustrated. Or, I guess wait, is there a special specific term? Because technically we don't know if she takes care of it herself, but you know certainly the the yeah, you know, not being able to directly physically touch someone that's going to affect how you how you think about. It. So, yeah, you know, sometimes yeah, you know, several of the characters are mental patients. You know, maybe they're just sexually frustrated, but just yeah, you know, and and yeah, sometimes when it's brought up it's just a joke, a bit of color. But I don't think it's random. I, I think it's a show Bible thing. I think there was a decision made. Let's bring up sex at least once per episode. And, and yeah, you know, the... I mean, there's maybe also... A, maybe, maybe it can help normalize that there's so much media that doesn't bring up sex. Which, fair enough for the stuff that's for kids. Obviously. Don't want it there. You know, but... At, at the very most, you know, maybe make like a slight little reference that the adults pick up on, but the kids and maybe even teenagers just don't realize that that's a thing, you know. But this is very overt, and yeah, like it's just part of life, you know. There's there's other things that are much more frequent in media that are also just parts of life, but there's less shame connected to it and as such it comes up more in media and let's see then we have yeah yeah um once tonami has everything he he wants you know he's he's he gets up and he's about to walk away and then sid tells philly you know she knows david and yeah, it's a it's a nice little moment, you know, because Tonami is like, we're gonna get caught, you know, and yeah, just great little, yeah, you know, Sid doesn't like the idea of just using Philly for her connection to David, you know, obviously, like, they need to get some information out of her, but it's not, yeah, and... Then we get the detail that apparently, even though in in memories, the you know the friend is is Lenny. She's you know uh, Philly says that it was Benny, and that's also later what. Dr. Poole, or the eye posing as Dr. Poole says. So, yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting, um, I, yeah, I'm, I really, it's, it's very fascinating how, what, what they're doing with Lenny slash Benny and you know we get a couple of clips where we see no that's you know that's Benny where we thought it would be Lenny and then you know Philly whispers they are watching which just yeah so creepy this this would be a really cool place this would be an awesome place for a fight like there could be ninjas and ropes and Helicopters. So, like, Carrie is just, like, the overexcited 12-year-old. And I'm here for it. It's just, she's just, yeah. I, you know, this is a character that could easily be 
super annoying, and I'm sure some people do find her to be, but Amber and Thunder just strikes that perfect balance where just, yeah. Also, in, in part, the fact that, like, I don't lose interest when she's talking about stuff other than fighting. Like, when she told us about her, you know, yeah, how it came to be that there were two Carrie's louder milk. Yeah, that was fascinating. There's a lot of characters where I'm like, I want to see him fight, but if they start talking, I'm like, okay, can we, can we skip ahead? And let's see. Um, yeah, I I cannot but wonder if like, you know, Carrie, like she's a she's a fun ca Carrie with the K, fun character, like really, like. En engaging character, not super mature, and I have to wonder if that's maybe this thing of how she ages slower. Like, you know, she, again, the actress was 18, 19 at the time. Maybe she mentally isn't that old. Maybe, like, physically. Because if, if she doesn't age in real time, Maybe her brain doesn't age the same as her body. I I don't know. Maybe it'll. There's some people. You know, I'd I'd like to think I'm still a child at heart. I'm almost twice as old as you know she was at the time. But yeah, just really really interesting character. And I I like the line. So you became a lighthouse keeper. I like to think I was always a lighthouse keeper. And again, yeah, he confirms, no, no, no the, the friend was Benny, not Lenny. And then, you know, yeah, again, the question, what did the stars say? And, and yeah, Dr. Poole says, you know, I, I, had, a, I had a wife, I had kids. Now I can't see out of one eye. He ruined my life, and I just want to ask him why. Fantastic. Just, yeah, really, really compelling scene. Just, and Carrie with a K realizes it's a trap, and I love the smile on her. Like, she looks dangerous. Like, holy crap. Like, you know, I've been making a lot of references out. Oh, she's really cool. If she smiled like that and I was nearby, I'd run in the other direction. That's like, holy crap. And yeah, she's we've never seen her this excited before in the in the show. You know, she is just gleeful at the chance to, to get to kick ass. And yeah, Dr. Poole was always the eye in disguise, or they swap bodies. I'm still not 100 percent sure how the eyes powers work but it's a it's an interesting detail that Tonami's tactic might have prevented the the trap from being as effective as ultimately it it was fairly effective Sid said no we'll just talk to him Tonami wanted to to scan minds I think that would have uncovered the eye and they would have you know been Although I suppose they would still have been in more or less the same situation. No, yeah, because the like the troops had to get into position, didn't they? And, you know, it's a it's a classic thing of you know a piece of fiction saying you know you gotta do. It's not gonna be pretty, but you gotta do it the hard way. It's or you gotta yeah you gotta do it the tougher way. You gotta do it the and also doesn't work. You got to do it the way that is more ruthless. And yeah, the my turn, so cool. And th the eye is apparently impossible to hit with bullets, which is another great, you know, really cool power. And then Tonami. And the eye, like, basically use psychic powers against each other. 
another really cool concept and we see Carrie with a K fight and Carrie with a C carrying out the same movements very very cool like I've seen I mean at this point it must be thousands must be over 1000 at least fight scenes in my life and I think this is the only one where it cuts back and forth between the person doing the fighting and the person whose body yeah whose body matches the movements and ultimately carry with a K is outnumbered and overpowered really devastating and Lenny is back. If Aubrey Plaza is in every episode of the show, I will be exceedingly happy about that. And, you know, we get some more, like, seemingly Lenny does think of Lenny as male. And David doesn't argue with that because, you know, David says, blow me. Lenny says, I don't swing that way, bro, but you can talk me into a circle jerk. You know, it's, again, you know, there's, you know, uh, how, how do you put it? Gender is a spectrum. You know, it's, there's, there's multiple different options, but it does appear that Lenny either isn't or at least isn't thought of by themselves and, and others as cis female, you know, and yeah, it's it's really, really interesting. I yeah. And let's see. Yeah, and then the thing, you know, who are you? You, me, and then she sings like, wow. Right, right uh, yeah, they sing. I, I should probably refer to Lenny as, as they until I'm confident exactly what they are meant to, to be. Ah, what their gender is meant to. And yeah. David makes it out, cra makes the car crash with his powers, and, you know, hands the knife to Sid, but it's actually the eye as Sid. And, you know, very, very politely, you know, Sid Eye asks, you know, would you like your knife back? by which I mean the knife in your back and yeah really a nice bit where they they swap bodies back and then carry with a K is hit with a bullet and Lenny reappears and and for the second time this episode we see you know yeah, I would pretty much say Lenny is the devil with the yellow eyes. The, the in yeah, you know the, the yeah Lenny and the devil with the yellow eyes are two forms, two different appearances of the same being. And yeah, really, really hyped to see what happens next. I'm really glad that I'm going to be watching the next episode tomorrow instead of having to wait a week. And IMDb trivia for this episode. In the forest scene, one of the characters remarks that we make a good place for a fight. This is the same forest from X-Men The Last Stand, in which a fight takes place between Wolverine and Magneto's mutant brotherhood. One of the few good things about that movie. Would have been nice if the fight mattered. And ah, the poem that Oliver recites is California Supermarket by Allen Ginsberg. Oliver Bird, beginning narration and appearance, bear a resemblance to the late Orson Welles, also a narrator himself. 
in the lighthouse once the attack starts and Emma Thunder leads her team to the top of the lighthouse. She marches towards the window and says, my turn to protect her team. That's a pretty clear homage to Summer Glau's big scene. Uh, hmm, I feel like this is a spoiler, but yeah. Hmm, yeah. Summer and Amber have similar builds and voices and could almost be body doubles. That is true, yeah. I hope they're in something together. That could be quite cool. First appearance of the Astral Plane, which frequently appears in the Marvel Universe, especially X-Men. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, Carrie Loudermilk wears a blue pantsuit and brown trench coat, similar to James Arthur Madrox, a.k.a. Multiple Man, in the X-Factor comics. Ma multiple Man can create multiple versions of himself, whereas, yeah, the Carries Loudermilk are two different people that share the same body. At the start of the show, Oliver says the story will be told in five acts. This is correct throughout the episode. First act is the investigation. Second act is the revelation from Amy that she and David never had a daughter's children. Third is David meeting Oliver in the astral plane. The fourth is when Sid and Tony meet Philly. And the final act is when the team meet the eye at the lighthouse. And... Yeah. Until tomorrow, I'm you, I'm me, I'm everything you want to be.